If you go to our website, www.bbcenglish.org, we have an outline. It's called uh, Theological Studies Outline. If you search for that in our website, you'll find our outline. It'll cover all the teachings that we cover. Okay, so tonight we'll be covering the topic of suffering. Suffering. So why is there suffering on this earth and how do Christians deal with that? So let's cover the first point, which is essential. Please let me know if I'm out of bounds. Understanding suffering. Understanding suffering. What do we have to understand about this? Well, this is a very important verse. This is probably one of the most important points out of all the teaching, actually. So you might want to know this one. This is probably one of the most important. Philippians chapter 1, please, and then we'll read verse 29. Suffering is as much of an opportunity for you like salvation, believe it or not. So you got to realize this. If salvation is that much prized to you, you appreciate such opportunity and privilege of suffering. You've got to understand this fact that in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, suffering is as much of an opportunity like salvation. Notice that the Bible says right here, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ. Wow, what kind of honor? Gold, silver? <laughs> Not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Yes. That should be an honor and a privilege. Amen. Because the reason why it gives you, out of all things in life, it gives you the most perfect chance to become like Jesus Christ. Out of anything in this earth, it's suffering. 1 Peter chapter 2, please. 1 Peter chapter 2. We will read verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2. And we will read verse 21. It's as much as an opportunity as salvation. That's what suffering is. We've got to understand that fact. That way we don't keep praying to God. Lord, please take away the pain that I'm feeling. Please take away the hurt. Well, when you do that, you take away your chance to become more like Jesus. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2, and we will read verse 21. If you want to please your Savior, I know how many of you want to please God and make Him proud. And I made that kind of dedication to the Lord too and prayed, Lord, I want to make you proud. I want to be one of the top 10 or the top 100 people in heaven that makes you the most proud. And then when I prayed that request, there was tremendous amount of suffering in my life. Why is that? Because that is your chance to become more like him, to please him. Notice that the Bible says right here, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us. Why? Leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. So you've got to understand the fact that Jesus Christ suffered on our behalf so that we can learn to follow what he did. Hebrews chapter 12, please. Hebrews chapter 12, we will read verse 2 through 4. Remember this, your suffering can never amount to the suffering Jesus went through. Amen. So before you whine and complain and be in grief, you got to realize this, Jesus' suffering is much more hard than yours. And if you want to be just a little bit like Jesus, that's why he gave you a little bit of suffering. And when he gave you that little bit of suffering, you're already about to throw in the towel and quit. Right. You're already about to whine. Look at that. Look at the book of Hebrews chapter 12, and we will read verse 2 through 4. Look at when he was whipped, he was spitten upon, he was cursed, and he was stripped naked, and he took the sins of all mankind upon himself. And then you, on the other hand, you just, you went through that much amount of suffering as Jesus did, you're saying? Look at Hebrews chapter 12. We will read verse 2. You did not even shed blood. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your minds, right? You are weary, you're fainting, so you've got to consider his suffering. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, 
striving against sin. No, you didn't. So you shouldn't throw in the towel. Why? Because you did not go through what Jesus went through. You did not even shed one drop of blood. So we should accept the suffering. And here's something that's very important, is that lost people can never have this promise. Look at Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8. So think about this. How many lost people are going through suffering like you are or even worse than you? And then we feel like that we should blame God and get mad at him. But the problem is this. The problem is, is that if there was no God, then your life would be worse because you're going to be like every lost person who's going through that suffering but without God working it for good. That's right. So you got to understand this fact that being a Christian going through suffering is far better than a lost person. Amen. Because if you feel like that you want to blame God for the suffering, think about it. A lost person does not have God in his life. And if God did not exist, that doesn't erase your suffering. It doesn't erase your suffering, whether God exists or not. It you will go through the same mess. So you should be actually very grateful concerning your suffering because God promised that it would work together for good. Amen. That's even better. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things, did it say all things? Yeah. All right, work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the, are you the called according to his purpose? Yes, if you are, then you should rejoice in your suffering. Yes, so these four points will be extremely helpful when you're going through suffering. As you go through suffering, remember these, remember these four points, and then you'll become more understanding why we all go through suffering and not to get so easily discouraged or weary. Now we're going to go through forms of suffering. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and then we'll read verse 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and then we'll read verse 14. The first form of suffering you'll notice is mental. It's mental. So there is a mental Suffering. It does not have to be just solely physical where you shed blood. Suffering can be something of the mind where you're struggling with thinking a certain thought, maybe a temptation or sin, or it could be a lot of discouragement, depression, and worry and stress that's boggling your mind. Notice 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort. See, you have to comfort because there's some form of suffering here. The who? Feeble-minded. So notice right here, there is a mental form of suffering. All right, these other four, we're not going to look at them. Uh, let me know if I'm out of bounds as I go down and down. The next one is financial, Philippians 4.12. Philippians 4.12. Again, we won't turn to these verses for time's sake. Some of you are struggling financially. That is a form of suffering that God considers. Number three is spiritual, spiritual. Some of you are going through demonic oppression, perhaps even possession, or perhaps Satan, he's just tormenting your life with sin and temptation or making you so bogged down and tired. So there's a spiritual form. There's also a physical form, which is a no-brainer. Everyone goes through some form of physical suffering today. That's Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 3. Another form of suffering that we all go through is any trouble in life. So you got to understand this. Any trouble you go through in life, that's why we'll call, we'll call it suffering quite often. So any suffering you go through in life, you don't have to be a martyr for Jesus. God considers any trouble you go through in life as a form of suffering. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. Okay, now let's talk about accepting suffering. Let's talk about accepting suffering. So, this will be very releasing, is that once you learn to accept what you're going through. Let's go to 2 Timothy 3, please. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll read verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and then we'll read verse 12. Will you be willing to accept the struggles and the pain that you're going through? If you don't, then you will live in fear and hurt. People think that living the Christian life is what? Everything's great. I'm going to heaven. Saved from hell. God's going to bless me. And 
I've got a wonderful family here in church, and uh, wrong. One brother turns against a brother, a sister turns against a sister. All of a sudden, you know, your family hates you as soon as you attend our church. And then, uh, am I talking about your life right here? And then all of a sudden, you, your job is struggling, your school is struggling, and you're like, God, what in the world? <laughs> that means you're in the right church. <laughs> you fail to see that the Christian life is not full of blessing. It's quite the opposite. It's full of suffering. When you get saved, yes, it's one of the greatest days in your life, but you're only thinking about the blessing. you got to realize this. Once you get saved, you don't realize what you signed up for. You signed up for pain. You signed up for struggle. And that's why there are some people who do not want to become a saved Christian because they know what's going to happen. Notice in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall what? Suffer persecution. Now that's a promise. <laughs> that's a promise. Wow. That's a promise, a guarantee. If you live godly, you're going to suffer. Man, is that a way to motivate people to get right with God, to start serving Him? Hey, start living godly. Get rid of that worldly music. Get rid of that worldly dressing. Get... Come to church, start doing soul winning, and guess what? Your finances are going to run out. Guess what? Your family is going to turn against you. Guess what? You're going to suffer pain and health problems. Boy, people aren't going to come to church after this. What are you all doing here? You're all crazy, man, coming to this church. Now look at Job chapter 1. We're going to have to turn here. A lot of people think Satan is the cause for suffering. So you'll notice that as a church, I totally understand. We'll mention about the devil's mad at us, Satan's attacking this church, Satan's harming your life. So it is very true. Why? Because if you live for God, the enemy is not just going to let you keep going. He wants you to quit. But you got to realize this. Satan is not the cause for it. The ultimate cause who allowed him to do it is God Almighty. God gives permission. God gives permission. Wow, really, Pastor? That's right. Why would God allow Satan to do that? That's what you got to learn to accept the suffering. So it's very releasing if you realize that even though Satan hates you and he's attacking you, there's a peace at the same time. Because you know that God allowed it, God permitted it because he's trying to work it for something better. He knows your limitations. And he knows the ultimate victory you can get at the end. So no matter what pain you're going through, the bottom line is this. God is still on the throne. He's still in control. Do you know how releasing that is from your fear and worry? Now look at Job chapter 1. Now the whole chapter should be read to see this. But we're going to just look at selected verses here. Look at verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and above all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So look at that. God allowed Satan to do that. One of the greatest dramatic stories you'll ever read in the Bible between God and Satan is Job, the book of Job. That's where you actually see the confrontation between God and, uh, between God and Satan, between God and Satan. So when you see that conflict, it is very dramatic. Uh, many sermons, endless sermons were preached out of the book of Job concerning suffering. One of my best messages was, about suffering at the book of Job. I wanted to find a unique passage, but Job just could not be topped at all concerning suffering. If some of you are going through a hard time, my recommendation is to listen to my sermon. It's called Suffer the Devil's Rage. If you watch that sermon, I think that will immensely help you. Uh, I first preached that sermon when one of our members lost um, her daughter through, uh, her daughter was shot by gangsters. So um, I preached that sermon. And I guess the Lord moved in that time. But that sermon I preached several times. And maybe one day I'll preach that again. Okay, Acts chapter 9, please. Acts chapter 9. We've got to get moving. We've got to get moving. Okay, Acts chapter 9. But I pondered on this for quite a while because it is an important chapter. And the sermon 
can probably speak to you concerning that. Now, you got to understand this. People think that God's plan is only good things, but that is false. God's plan, you must understand, includes sufferings. It's not just, I'm going to reward you. I'm going to make you king. I'm going to turn this for good. I'm going to bless you immensely when you live for me. Those are his promises, but that's not his only promise. It has to include suffering. That's his plan in your life. The Bible says, Acts chapter 9, verse 16, For I will show him. So this is about the Apostle Paul before he got saved. Before Paul got saved, notice what God said. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Can you imagine that? Man, man that someone can preach a sermon out of this. You can just name a certain individual. Man, there's Gene Kim, and maybe he's living like the devil, he's drinking, but one day he's going to get saved, and I've got great plans for him. He's going to get mocked. He's going to pastor a church at San Francisco Bay Area. He's going to suffer loss of church, and he's going to have enemies turning against him. But you know what? I've got great plans for him through those sufferings. One day he'll die for me, stuff like that. So you see, God has great plans for you. This is not just Gene Kim. It was you before you got saved. When you got saved, God said, I have great plans for you. Stan's going to lose finances. Sean's going to have family problems. Robert, he's going to lose his health, et cetera, et cetera. See? Thank you, Lord. How about that? That will preach. That can preach right there. All right, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. What kind of people are we rejoicing about sufferings? Have you ever seen anyone in America doing something like that? What kind of people, what kind of religion teaches you that? Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Suffering is considered to be purely sadness by people. But you got to realize that suffering is something joyful, as I mentioned before. What kind of religion will teach you that? What kind of book? Name me any book that will teach you that. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, what does it say? Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is even evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matter. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Did you read that? Let him not be ashamed. But let him what? Glorify God on this behalf. When you accept suffering, you got to accept it with joy. And that is one of the hardest things you can ever do in life when you're feeling the pain. And one of the people that I ever saw closest to that, besides reading the martyr stories about literally, I'm not kidding you, they are thrilled with joy when they get tied up and burnt at the flames of the stake. And if you think the pain you're feeling right now is bad, have fire burn on you. Yes, sir. For every excruciating second, and you know how bad hell fire is? That's why God chose hell, because he knows how much pain burning is. Burning is one of the worst tortures you can ever feel. Yet these martyrs, they accepted the worst kind of pain and torture, the burning. And they were joyful, story after story. But besides reading about those cases, the closest I ever saw in person was a guy named Big Chuck who's suffering cancer and pain, and he's in a bad mood because he's feeling that pain, suffering all kinds of breathing problems and heart issues and etc. And he said, I thank God for this pain and I take pleasure in my sufferings. And he puts power in that. Amen. All right, reasons for suffering. Reasons for suffering. Have you ever done that, Pastor? I'll be very honest, I really don't remember because I would usually rem re remember crying about it, right? <laughs> I would usually remember crying about it. I hope I was somehow spiritual enough where I thank God for the pain. So I don't really remember, to be honest. But that's how it should be, taking joy for the pain. All right, punishment. There are reasons for suffering. One of them is punishment. Go to John chapter 5, please. John chapter 5. 
Now, we're not going to look at all these passages, but we're going to look at one of them. John chapter 5, and then we'll read verse uh, 14, verse 14. The second passage, which we will not turn to, is Numbers chapter 12, verse 10, and 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 12. So when we go through suffering in life, an important thing is to not think, it is so easy to think that Satan is attacking you, that you are somehow very godly, and that's why these, these persecution happen to you. No, the first thing you should think about is probably because you sinned and messed up against God. Look at John chapter 5, verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. So this guy was suffering some kind of pain. Why? Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. So notice that this person was in pain, suffering such pain. Why? Because he was sinning. So God punished him. All right, another thing is because of the sins of others. Sins of others. What, you're serious, Pastor? Yeah. I've seen so many cases in church and even in my life where somebody else's sin caused me to suffer, caused someone else to suffer. So you got to realize this. When you're sinning against God, let me rebuke really hard right here, you people. You think that well, you know, I'm going to bear the consequence of my sin. And when you think like that, you're very selfish when you adamantly, stubbornly sin against God. You have no idea, friend, that your sin is going to cause somebody else to suffer. You think it's just you? No, you're going to break so many hearts of other people because of your stubbornness, because of your wickedness and your pride. Do you know how many people I've seen in church break their hearts over somebody somebody that they bring to church and they're unable to receive Christ for salvation. And because of that wickedness and that pride, it hurts some honest good brother and sister in the church. Do you know how many cases I've seen because of somebody messing up their lives in sin, wickedness, committing crime, and etc., that affects some family member out there? And you church members got to realize this. You got to realize sin is no joke. And if altar call is open, I'd take advantage if I were you. It is something serious. You can't think that, oh, it's just me. No. If you have someone that you love out there, it will affect them. One way or another. It will affect them. So you got to realize that fact. All right. So let's look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 right here. So notice that if you think that God is messing around with sin, no. Adam, what, what happened just because him and Eve sinned? Look at us today. See, are we all happy today? No, the pain of sin passed upon everybody because of Adam and Eve's sin. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Altar calls open. All right, satanic attack. That's another reason why. So, Remember this, the closer you get to God, the closer you'll get to who, you think? You'll get to the devil. Job chapter 1, we read that. And then look at Luke chapter 13, please. Luke chapter 13, and we'll read verse 16. In Job chapter 1, we read that passage where Job was living godly for God Almighty. And because of that, Satan chose him out of everybody else to attack. So that's another reason why we all go through suffering. Okay, Luke chapter 13, verse 16. Notice right here, And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom what? Satan hath bound. See, Satan can cause suffering. Lo, these 18 years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day. Glory of God. Let's look at John chapter 9. John chapter 9. The last part is the glory of God. So the reason why we all go through suffering, it's also because of God's glory. You got to realize this, that God cannot get, gain any glory out of your life if he is not able to use you. If he's not able to use something bad for something good. His power is more magnified when there is tragedy, when there is pain, when there is hardship. Because if everything is humpty-dory, how can God prove his miracle, his power? 
His miracle is proven when there's first hopelessness and loss and tragedy. And then when he intervenes, then you realize how powerful and how great God is. Look at John chapter 9, verse 2. Here's a perfect example right here. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Wow. Chapter 11 and verse 4. Chapter 11 and verse 4. I'll read that quickly. Lazarus died. Jesus actually waited for Lazarus to die. He didn't heal him. Why? When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. So why did Pastor Kim go through tremendous amount of suffering? To prove God's power that look at the fruits that we've gained, and if I can do it being single and uh, not all the money support, with people who uh, don't back me up and everything where I started from zero and enemies attacking me and where I'm a liberal area, don't you think this will encourage any missionary and pastor out there? So God's glory is magnified. So that's why this is important. Many times what we think about at the beginning is that because we've sinned, that's why we're going through pain. Johnny Erickson, she has a movie. I recommend watching that. It's very touching, but she... Yeah, John Erickson, or Joni, Johnny Erickson. But anyway, she uh, dived improperly and snapped her neck. So because of that, she became quadriplegic. So because of that, what, when she was in the hospital, she was confessing every th sin that she couldn't think of. And she said, Lord, what did I do wrong? Lord, what did I do wrong? And she even went through bitterness and anger against God, which is normal, like many Christians do. She even sought charismatic healing, but she didn't get healed. Now, you think and pray about that when you're all emotional, emotional about charismatic stuff. you got to realize not all the time it works that way. So, Johnny Erickson, she went through that much pain, but then she realized that the Lord used her pain for God's glory. And so, what did she do? She drew, the, she drew tremendous artworks by putting a pen in her mouth. Wow. Uh, 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 uh. And because of that, she was able to be a witness to many other people and lead them to Jesus Christ. So whereas atheists would talk about, you know, I'm mad at God and God doesn't exist, so that's why I became an atheist. You take this woman, she can witness to an atheist by just putting a pen in her mouth. All right, now let's look at purpose of suffering. All right, this is going to be good. Purpose of suffering. What's the purpose of suffering, Pastor? Well, if you look through this and you'd be encouraged. Really? In what way? Pastor, as soon as I get, got saved and I went to your church, all these bad things start to happen. Well, praise the Lord. That means you're in the right church then. It's to prove that you are a Christian. So the purpose of suffering is to prove you are a Christian. So if you're going through pain as soon as you came to our church, you should be thankful. That means you're doing something right. Yep. That means you're doing something right. Well, look at me. I'm atheist. I'm drinking, doing what's wrong, and nothing bad happened to me. Ha ha, God is not real. You should live in worry and fear after that. That means you're not in the right. Persecuted for doing right. So that's based. We won't turn there because we already read that verse. It's based off of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall what? Suffer persecution. All right. Well, what if I sin and mess up my life and then all these sufferings happen? Well, praise the Lord. You win either way. It proves that you are his child, that means. So see, whether you're doing wrong or you're doing right, if you're going through suffering, it proves you're a saved Christian. Yep. All right, so look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8. Wow, so in other words, brethren, the pain that you're going through right now, you're not a loser either way. You win either way. When you're going through pain in your life, it doesn't matter if you're sinning or if you're doing what's right, you win either way. It proves you are a saved Christian. Man, what a blessing, man. What a blessing. Ain't God good? All right, Hebrews chapter 12, and we will read verse 8. 
Did you ever notice when you start to sin against God that all of a sudden car accidents suddenly appeared out of nowhere and that uh, suddenly all of a sudden things went wrong in the family and that your organization on schedule work and everything just got messed up and you know that was God teaching you that you know why, child. Yeah. All right, Hebrews chapter 12, and we'll read verse 8. Notice that the Bible says right here, man, what a blessing here. The Bible says, but if he be without chastisement, see, if you have no God chastising you, giving you suffering for the sin you've committed, whereof all are partakers, then are ye what? Bastards and not sons. See, that means you're an illegitimate child. You're not God's saved child. So thank God for the suffering. Uh, when you're sinning against God because he's just trying to lead you to do what's right. Amen. All right, now, here's the next one. To produce holiness. It's to produce holiness. Look at Hebrews, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 5. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And then we'll read verse 5. Man, you just feel like running around the aisles after this. It's just going to get better and better, friend. It's going to get better and better. You see why this book is so important in your life. It is the solution, the problem solver of everything that you go through in life. Notice that the Bible says right here, which is a manifest token of the righteous uh, judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye what? Also suffer. So notice that because of this suffering, it makes you more worthy. It produces holiness. Why? Why me, God? I mean, you got the wrong person, God. I went soul winning more than any other person in the church. I'm the one who helped the pastor more than everybody in the church. I'm the one who preached, and it should be brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so who should go through the pain. Why is it me? Totally unfair, God. Totally unfair. Well, it's because you're the more holy one out of the bunch. That's why you went through that suffering, so that he can make you more holy. The other person he knows is worthless. So God's going to have to take more time with that other person to deal with. All right, Psalms chapter 126, please, and then we'll read verse 5. God is such a great God. He is not a person that you should get bitter and upset. He is not a person that you should uh, attack and become an atheist. How many people have became atheists because they went through something tragic in their lives? And because of that, they use that as an excuse to become one of the worst atheists in the world. Bart Ehrman and other people. Isn't that sad? Isn't it tragic? You know why? Because they never went to that book. And they did not claim the promises of that book of what God promised during suffering. All right, Psalms chapter 126. And then we'll read verse 5. They that sow in tears shall what? Reap in joy. See, remember this, every tear that you shed and cried, God remembered that and gave a gold piece for every teardrop that you shed. Thank you, Lord. See, it's to make fruit. It's to make fruit. What happens to all those times, Pastor, where you felt like quitting, where you contemplated death, where you felt like quitting, where you shed tears in private, when you couldn't share it to anybody else? And being a single person, I didn't have a wife or somebody else to talk to or cry upon. What happened to all that, Pastor? I produced a fruit right there and right there, right there, right there, and right there, and then to right here on the live stream with so many people watching online and all the views and then all the souls I led to Jesus Christ. I think that's pretty good fruit. Amen. All right, let's look at uh, James chapter 2, verse 2. James chapter 2 and verse 2. This is extremely important, and actually even secular, secular humanists Understand this fact, too, when they teach psychology. It's to mature and test our character. I think this is very treasured right here. you got to realize this, is that stressful situations I went through before, I've gotten used to it, and I don't panic as much anymore. And they don't, there are times that they don't even bother me. And then I've had some people who went through uh, the similar pain that I went through, and uh, they said, man, I'm stressed out. I don't know how you handle it, Pastor. But I'm able, and then they're like, I don't get it. How can you handle it? I'm so stressed out. But then I've seen them later on where when they went through similar sufferings that they matured out of it and it doesn't bother them as much anymore. What's extremely important about the pain that you're going through is to test your character. Amen. It's to mature you. We're very, uh, 
you got to realize this. The ones who are the most baby level people are the ones who are the most sensitive to pain the most. Yep. That's why babies, you have to coddle them all the time. Because the slightest amount of pain, it will make them cry automatically. And that's grown adults save Christians today. Amen. They're all babies. The greatest adult is the one who can take in the pain and say, hit me. Hit me. That's the thing. So when we're in this online ministry, you got to realize this, is that uh, you, you have to take, you're an open target where everyone's going to attack yes, you. Sir. And then if I can do it at this young age, being single, without family, without, pe uh, without someone that I can lean upon, and in this wicked liberal area, don't you think that the, if the Lord blessed me this much and helped me with my character, he can help you out? Now, I want to say this, okay? I'm not, the great, I'm not a great person. I'm a wretched sinner. But I want to say this to some proud onliners, which is why they sob about their hardships and trials they're going through. This is why I want to get on you, YouTubers, all right? This is your problem. Now, I'm not getting up on you online people who watch us and stuff like that, but I am getting on you YouTubers who run a channel, and then you get all sensitive and mad, and then you pick fights with each other, and then you whine about every pain that you go through in life. You know what your problem is? Your problem is, is that when you go through, you got to realize when you take an internet ministry, that's an open target. And that's where you take in a lot amount of pain. And when you do that, you got to realize this. When you set yourself open target like that, you should expect the kind of pain that you go through. And that's not a time when you act like a baby. When you go through pain and suffering, that's when you keep it to yourself and land it toward God. You vent it out all toward God, and you don't show that toward other people, and you don't act immature and pick fights with everybody, and you get jealous. You get jealous of honest Bible believers who went through tremendous pain. You don't know what kind of pain that I went through, and you guys get all upset and jealous, bitter and mad because of the fruit that the Lord may have blessed me with and other Bible believers online with, and you get all jealous and mad, and then you attack me. You know why I don't attack some of you guys out there? The reason why is this, because the Lord taught me through suffering to mature my character. I went out and graduated. You didn't. The Lord put me in the similar trial like some of you guys out there. But you guys became childish and started to pick fights with one another cry and getting jealous of, oh, this brother has more subscribers than me. He must have compromised on something. You don't know what kind of pain that I went through. And only the people who are really close to me know the kind of pain that I went through. All right, let's look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, I didn't read James 2, did I? So this is important, sorry. And uh, James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Now start to grow up. If, you're, if you call yourself a preacher, if you call yourself a teacher helping souls, that's not a time where you start to chew out other Bible believers, act immature, and cry and whine about your hardships. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the hardship is because of this. Yeah, come on. How about that? And you got to realize this. This is the result. God tests your character. You mature out of it. Blaming. Bible-believing preachers, teachers about the pain that they went through. Oh, I blame Dr. Ruckman. Oh, I blame Bible-believing churches. Oh, I blame Gene Kim. Oh, I blame these people. Oh, I blame, and then you name all kinds of Bible-believing people. And then you all, you get churchless, and you get rebel, and you're all by yourself. And I hope that you guys heard me say that and, wa and watching this. That way, you, the Lord can speak to you. Look, I don't care if you're still against me, if you're still angry at me. At least what I want is that you heard and watched this message and you'll change your character more Amen. after this. Amen. That's what I at least want. Amen. All right, I'm done preaching. Let's look at right here, James chapter 2, verse 2. For, thank you. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and he have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou here, or sit here under my footstool. Yeah, that is a wrong verse right there. So I think it's James chapter 1. It's chapter 1. I knew it. So it's James chapter 1. Cross that out in your notes. I apologize. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. They're all good, brother. They're all good. They're all good right there. Some of you probably treat that way with the brethren amongst each other. So maybe, maybe the Lord, maybe the Lord divinely anointed that just now. 
right. James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when he fall into diverse temptations. Why is that? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. It tests your character. All right. Um, let me go through this quickly. Okay, so... I, I apologize. I was in a preaching mode, so i got to wrap this up. Okay, this is so important to have the power of Christ. We're not going to turn to that passage. To have the power of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 through 10. The sixth point is to increase heavenly mindedness. It's to increase heavenly mindedness. Because the more that you see the 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 gloominess of this world the more you see the glamour of heaven now did that make any sense right now it makes you long more for heaven properly it makes you see how disgusting this world is oh what wonderful people we have in this world but when you draw closer to jesus and go through more suffering you realize how much more ugly people are amen, amen. that includes you too preacher yeah bless god i increase my disgust for self even more man when I draw closer to God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12a, James chapter 1, verse 12, it will show it's to increase, uh, to receive rewards. It's so that you can receive rewards. Man, I can preach a long time out of all these points, but that would take up the entire Wednesday night service. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 6, it's also done where you can benefit another person. So you got to realize it's the tears and the sweat that you shed, it helped somebody else out there. Where I get endless emails and phone calls of people who got saved, I think that's worth it. Where I see somebody else come to this church and they end up preaching on my pulpit, I think that's worth it. It benefited somebody else out there. My pain made a person a preacher. My pain got a person saved. My pain made a person another Bible believer. My pain helped somebody out there. It's not about you, it's about others. So think about that when you go through pain. It's to perfect you. That's one of the most important points. It's to perfect you. So it tests your character, but what you want is that you got to realize is that what God does is not only to test you to see if you pass the test, but it's also done where it perfects your life, makes you more perfect. And when people tell me, when they look at my older videos and my newer ones, how much I've grown, that means the world to me. That is evidence of the sufferings I went through, how God perfected my life. Response to suffering. Oh my goodness, I apologize. Wow. Okay, I can't write this. Let me wrap it up. Okay, so you all have to rewind this once I put this in archived video. Response to suffering is we may despise it. That's Job chapter 6, verse 4 and verse 9. That's the worst response you can ever make. We may faint from it. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 13. This is a common response many people make. We may dislike it. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. We think this is a normal response. If something bad happens, we don't like it. But that is still wrong, you've got to understand. We may bear it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. That is our lowest right response. you got to realize this. It's not just, okay, I can put up with it. I can put up with it. That just builds up a lot more stress anyway. Yeah. So you got a right reaction where you don't get bitter and mad at God, but there's a stress level right there. So that's the lowest right response. What's the highest right response? We may rejoice in it. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13. That's the highest level of a right response you can ever reach. And this is not something that can just happen just all of a sudden like that. It takes so much spiritual maturity and journeying between God and you. Suggestions during suffering. So this might be very helpful for you. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25. Remember that the worst sufferings for a Christian is better than the best Amen. pleasures of life. Amen. That will be extremely helpful. Romans chapter 15, verse 4 shows that you should read the Bible because it is very comforting. Uh, Job and Psalms are the best ones for the Old Testament. First Peter is the best one for the New Testament. And those are only my opinion, though. Pray to the Lord because he will regard the prayers of the destitute. Psalms chapter 102 and verse 17. Assure yourself by leaving everything in the well-doing of God. 
that is completely stress relieving. First Peter chapter four, verse 19. Tell yourself that you are in the right path when you are still persecuted. Galatians chapter five, verse 11. Use your suffering to mightily comfort others. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse four. Every time a lot of you guys would say, man, that's a great sermon, man, that's a great sermon. But you gotta understand this, that great sermon was born out of stress, yep. sleepless night and tears that I never told you. So you got to realize this, I took advantage of that suffering and pain to preach it out to you. Amen. You should use it as well. Uh, last one, keep serving God. Why? Because it's going to encourage others who are suffering. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. What made this preacher not quit? Uh, endless emails of people talking about, oh, I got cancer, but uh, I watch you online, thank you. That encouraged me to keep pastoring. Uh, Brother Chuck saying, I thank God for cancer. That made me quit whining about my pain that I went through. Do I have cancer? <laughs> so that is the blessing of uh, suffering. Keep encouraging yourself. Why? Because it's going to encourage somebody else out there. You know what it did? Encourage me to remain online for you. Encourage me to keep pastoring you. Because I remember all the other people here and people online who went through suffering. God, my Father, thank you so much for using our suffering for your glory. Thank you so much that your suffering has power in it. And that same power can be given to us. We have the blessing and the opportunity to bask in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. 
Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you. Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount? A passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own defense department would survive its application. King James onlyism is double standards. Now there's a false doctrine out there called dispensationalism. Yeah, I, I don't believe one saved always saved. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. But you don't want to get identified with the reproach of what really believing this Bible is all about. You know what these wicked left-wing liberal perverts want you to do? Legalizing the marijuana or homosexuality or if the whole entire world turns against the Lord. Is that person saved? Is that person on their way to heaven or hell? The common kind of person has no thought of God in their mind. That people will leave the church over the color of the carpet. What's wrong with our churches? Why don't we have a closer walk with Jesus? Why isn't everybody running around like little Jesus is shouting and screaming and hollering? That thing you look in the mirror, it don't want to go street preaching. It don't want to read the Bible. It don't want to pray. It wants to watch TV and a bunch of other junk. A lot of you don't have it because you're lazy. That's why you don't have it. Because you won't work. That's why. Don't you know the Bible says, Whoa! Unto the wicked! And I'll tell you, Jesus Christ loved you enough. He came down here, put up with your dirty ways. The wages of sin is death. When you offer somebody a gospel track, if uh, you're walking away and you see them throw it on the ground, that's not because they're afraid of what's in it, they know what's in it. No matter where you are today, turn to God and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God Almighty got me through and got me through for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 35 years, 40 years. You mess with that book, honey, I'll mess with you. Shame on you if you don't think about it. Shame on you if you don't think about it. Shame on you if you don't think this with Jesus Christ. Shame on you. I'll have to whip that smile out of you. This effect, huh? Folks, this the fact that we're in Christ will never see hell is enough to shout about it. Give me your power, Lord. You know what we need? We need people to fall on their knees. We need people to pray to the Lord, raise the King James Bible high, believe in this sensational truth, and Lord, I just don't want their power. I pray like Elisha, double the portion, Lord. Give it within me. Do it within me the filling power of your spirit. Give me your power, Lord. Give me your power. Give me your power. And God, the Holy Spirit, will move upon this church and fill within him his Holy Spirit power. Amen. Then we'll see soul saved. Then we'll see God do something with this truth. Then we'll see the liberals and the homosexuals getting a thing. Then we'll see those apostate Christians getting mad. Then we'll see all the world opening their eyes to the truth and they say, yeah, we have not seen such a thing. Brother, sister, there's only one hope. Looking for that blessed hope of the glorious appearing of the man God, our Savior, Jesus Christ.